Shabbat Shalom. Teddy Roosevelt. You all know him, right? Hopefully you have a little bit of familiarity with uh, that part of American history. He was very famous for speak softly and carry a big stick, uh, which is why uh, on the Mount Rushmore sculpture of him, there is a, an enormous stick as part of the sculpture, right? No? No? But, I mean, surely in every portrait they have him with a giant stick on his shoulder. In the White House, we have at least photos of him with a big stick next to the Oval Office desk. Are you telling me this man never actually carried a stick? There was no stick? You know, crop, writing crop. A writing crop is not a big stick. And, and was he exactly a softly spoken man? A man of very meek and mild temperament? Yeah, he was a boisterous guy, right? This was not your, uh, your quiet, shrinking violet. Uh, this was somebody, like you said, who was not only a rough rider in his military unit, but was kind of a rough rider in life. Uh, the ultimate irony, of course, was that his daughter even out rough rode him, which is a whole nother story. If you don't know about Teddy Roosevelt's daughter, look her up. Amazing, amazing story. So why do we say he spoke softly and carried a big stick? What does that mean? All right, he was polite, he was diplomatic, he always wanted to avoid belligerent diplomatic uh, statements, but he wanted to make sure that his politeness and his uh, civility, uh, for which he would win the Nobel Prize for negotiating the peace between Japan and Russia, that that was not mistaken for weakness. And so he wanted to ensure that America indeed would have the military power to back up her interests and to protect her citizenry, even if we didn't go around saying, we're a big dog. Just be a big dog, but don't go around barking. And that way people will treat you with respect, and you will not unnecessarily engage in hostilities through the uh, accidents of your barking, uh, to mix metaphors between sticks and dogs. So there was no stick. There was no stick, and his, speech, his own speech was not at all what he was describing in that what do we call that then? A lie? A mistruth? A metaphor? An aphorism? So next you'll be telling me that God did not take us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. That there was no hand. Is that what you're telling me? That there was no giant arm from heaven that was going, come on guys, come on, hurting us like baby ducklings out of the land of Egypt? There was no hand? We read in the Torah this morning that there was a mighty hand. That hand ain't there? Well, what else isn't there then? Does that mean it didn't happen? It says that the walls of the water rose up on each side of us, on the right and on the left. It repeats over and over again, the walls of the water, the walls of the water, the walls of the water. And we've all seen, of course, Charlton Heston get that walls of the water. If you grew up in California like me, Universal Studios used to have a ride where you could ride through the walls of the water as though you were going through the crossing of the ski. Are you saying those walls weren't walls? This is another metaphor? Or is that, that one, unlike the hand, that one was true. That one was not a poetic description, but was a literal description. Which one is it? Do you know? You don't know. How would you know? So the hand was like the cloud-shaped hand that was, or a hand-shaped cloud that was going, freedom's this way. It's a figure of speech. But if that's a figure of speech, then are the walls of water that provided the protection for us also a figure of speech? Or is that the literal word? Is that something meant to be taken without metaphorical adaptation? Is that not the big stick, but the actual battleships? 
Is that something that was concrete or fluid but real? Uh, the chariots have been found in the Red Sea, although most Jewish scholars would not have pointed to the Red Sea as the Yam Suf. Uh, we knew what the Red Sea was, and it was not the route we were taking. Um, the question becomes, okay, we crossed, we left. That is undeniable. We're not still in Egypt, right? Anybody here still Egyptian? Anybody here still actually working for Pharaoh? No, I didn't think so. So that part we definitely know as to be literally true, but that, of course, was never in doubt, because it's not poetically described that we left Egypt. It's just there is a lot of other poetry. If you were paying attention while standing to the, sound, uh, to the song of the sea, Shirat Hayam, which Debbie chanted, you may have noticed that it talks about our enemies sinking like stones. Well, to sink like a stone sounds an awful lot like poetry to me, because after all, they weren't stones, were they? They were human beings, and chariots and horses and other accoutrements. And how can you sink like a stone if you're already at the bottom of the, of, the, of the seabed when the water comes in? You're not sinking, you're just being covered. But metaphorically, poetically, sink like a stone actually works really, really well. And so the phrase is used. The phrase is used to convey an idea, not to give a journalistic account of the event. Now you might be thinking, but wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. But didn't the rabbis in the Haggadah, which is taken from the Midrash of much earlier origin, didn't they go out of their way to say that the crossing of the sea was a miracle of miracle of miracles? Uh, you, you've all read that part of the Haggadah, right? You don't all just skip that to get to the dinner. Right? When the rabbis begin to have their mathematical debate of how many multiples more great was the splitting of the sea than all the other plagues combined, uh, they begin by saying, well, the, first, the, the plagues are called the finger of God, but this is called the hand of God. So if there were 10 fingers, sorry, if there were 10 plagues for a finger, and now we have one hand, how many fingers? Therefore, this must be five times greater, right? This is 50, equivalent, equivalent to 50 plagues rather than to only 10 plagues. And then they begin to escalate and try and outdo each other. It's a great drinking game. Um, doesn't it sound like they're trying to magnify the miracle, to say it is greater and greater and greater? So isn't it irreligious, blasphemy maybe, to say that perhaps it wasn't so magnificent that the Charlton Heston version is a little overblown, that it might have been more poetry, less reality, Again, not to say that there wasn't a crossing, not to say we didn't leave, but that the Hollywood version that many of us have in our mind, that literal ex idea of the walls, like the walls of a building, or perhaps the Berlin Wall, or perhaps the Great Wall of China, whichever way you want to describe it, going up, 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 and indeed many later commentators would try and make it higher and higher. Is that because they thought it was literally hundreds and hundreds of feet high? No. The idea that this would have to be literally true, or else you were an unrepentant sinner who should be driven out of the community, is actually a modern idea. The obsession with literalism of reading a text is not ancient. The ancient people, ours and across the world, understood what the word poetry meant, and they understood that a text was there to elicit an emotion and to teach you a particular idea, and that it would use a variety of tools to achieve that. Many of them being poetic, metaphorical, or, or other forms of, uh, of symbolic language. But it was only beginning in a little bit in the 1700s, but mainly in the 18 and 1900s, that recent, that people began to get a bee in their bonnet about the literal reading of the text. Now it began, as many of the problems of recent years, in Christian Europe, because there had been this thing called the French Revolution. Don't worry, we'll get back to why we're talking about the French Revolution here. It may sound like a bit of a left turn. Ha ha, left turn, leftist, okay. Anyway. The French Revolution, which is where we, by the way, get the terms left and right as political spectrum. The French Revolution scared 
many people across Europe. It scared them because the people took over. Not just that the people took over, that the people were questioning the authority of those who had had their authority because they were born to that authority. How dare you ask me, says the king, to justify my policy. I'm the king, and you're just a peasant. You don't get to ask me why. You don't get to object. How dare you, says the priest, the bishop, the cardinal, how dare you ask me to justify why our policy is to spend what would be the equivalent of billions of dollars on building cathedrals rather than feeding the poor? This is the policy, and you have no business asking. The French Revolution, and to a lesser degree the American Revolution, which was across the Atlantic, so it wasn't quite so scary, and didn't involve as many guillotines, that made people get a little nervous. And at the same time, there was a parallel rise of what is often called rationalism, with the idea that we don't need to have received wisdom, received authoritative statements, that if we actually sit and think about this and work through and use a little math and some science and investigation, we can figure it out. I don't have to just shut up, be silent, be dumb, and let someone else tell me. I can actually do this, or more, more importantly, we can figure this out. Now that was mostly right. Some heavy limitations on, uh, on what pure reason can do by itself. Uh, Kant gave a few of them, but many more have been discovered since. And definitely we do not want to kick down all institutions of authority, says the rabbi. But if you were a figure of authority, if you were the priest, the bishop, the cardinal, if you were the, uh, the king, the prince, the lord, the earl, somebody who had hereditary authority of life and death, of prosperity or poverty, of judgments of moral virtue or vice, you would be terrified of this new wave. Because it means everything that you have in your life, all of your power, is about to get questioned. And you know you don't have answers. You've got no way to justify why you should be king. Because you cannot justify why you should be king. You have no reason to justify why the cardinal should be allowed to do X, Y, and Z while the peasants starve. Because it's the cardinal, you know there's no justification for that other than I'm the cardinal and I get to do it. But you've got to convince the people to stop asking these hard questions. So what do you do? You say, look at the Bible. See how it says there were walls on the sides of the Israelites, that God's hand was there to save them. What do you mean that's poetry? That's not poetry. It's literally true. And if you doubt the literal word of the Bible, then you are no longer a good Christian. And unfortunately, this would eventually seep into some Jewish communities as well. You are no longer a good Jew. To question the literal reading was to question, by implication, the authority of the person holding the book. And so to defend the authority of the person holding the book, they defended the literal words of the book in its most simplistic form. And it worked pretty well. The reactionary strength spread across Europe uh, absolutely crushed the 1848 revolutionary wave and has done pretty well ever since at protecting a large portion of sacred cow institutions and personages across the world. But at what price? By telling those who were not in power to go back to the process of shutting up and doing what the book tells them and not asking hard questions. Now in Judaism, we know that's not true. In Judaism, we know that when one rabbi would say it was 50 miracles and the next would say it was 250 miracles, that they were not trying to tell you literally how much miraculous powder was used. They were not measuring the megatons of miracles that were being exerted over the plagues and over the crossing. But instead, they were trying to inspire you with a story, with an image, with poetry, with metaphor, with simile, to understand the meaning of the miracle. And if you get caught up in asking only, did it happen, didn't it happen, did it happen like this, did it happen like this, how high were the walls, how low were the walls, if you get caught up in that, not 
as an exercise in order to exemplify, to aggrandize God's majesty and the importance of what happened at that sea, but only as a way to justify and shore up the crumbling power structures of corrupt institutions, then you have actually ended up serving Pharaoh rather than God. You have served the myth that was being destroyed by what God did at that sea. Because what God did at that sea had nothing to do with just making mountains of water. And it had everything to do with saying that people deserve to be free. And that those who perpetuated a structure where the Pharaoh could be whoever he wanted to be and destroy those underneath him because of the literal belief that he was a physical God, that needed to drown in the waters. Whether or not the literal Pharaoh did, the idea needed to sink like a stone. The idea that there would be God kings that would somehow understand what was right for the universe and be able to control it through their power, and none could dare question them and their word for what their word was, was real. That was what was swamped by the waters of the sea when we left and said, no, not us, nor should anyone else. And the march that we began out of Egypt is a march that we have continued and we have continued to lead others out of as well to show the world that you do not have to be beholden to those who say, shut up and do what I say because you're not allowed to ask because if you ask, you are wrong. But instead to say, speak up, ask, wonder, question. And if I don't have a good answer, then that may mean we need to fix something. And if I do have a good answer, that means I should be sharing it with you. And you should actually listen to it. Incohate anger is not actually a proper response. Judaism has led us out of that sea, and yet so many in the modern world have become fixated on the water itself rather than the meaning of passing through it. Now, I know I'm speaking a little bit here to the choir, but just make sure that you understand within our own lives, when we wonder about Jewish ritual and Jewish practice, when we question about Jewish history, when we look back into the Midrashim, the stories of our ancestors, are you looking at them going, wow, it's really amazing that Abraham grew up in an idol household and smashed a bunch of idols? Or are you saying, wow, it's really amazing that our ancestors recognized that there must have been a person named Abraham who came within this weird culture of idolatry and found his way to God nonetheless. What could that have looked like? How can I explain to you what it would be like? How can I give you an image that you will remember in order to keep the content true? But if you forget the content, but only remember the cool story, well, I know that there are many ancient rabbis turning around in their graves. Because they didn't come up with the story just to give you a bedtime tale. They came up with the story to give you a package, a, a wrapper for a deeper truth that you could continue to delve into and un, unwrap as you continue to age. Judaism never asked you to check your reason and rationality at the door. Judaism never said, the more you believe stupid things, the more righteous you are. Judaism said, yes, there are things we don't understand. And yes, there are miracles beyond our comprehension. But we don't start there. We start with, what does this mean? And how can we understand this? And we may end up at a place where we say, I've reached the limits of what I can understand. But that is only after years and a lifetime of searching and study. Because it is in that struggle that we come to understand the meaning, the message, the point of the miracles in the first place, which was not just to get something flashy for the movie poster. Shabbat Shalom.